Finally, how can we solve this problem? Solution number one, educate providers about addiction. That was a huge thrust of Sean's talk, educate providers about pain. That's also certainly very true for addiction. One of the first things we need to educate providers about is that addiction really is a brain disease. Obviously, it's not a brain disease like glioblastoma multiforme is a brain disease. But then again, chronic pain is not a brain disease the way that getting your leg cut off, cut off in an automobile accident is a brain disease, right? Acute versus chronic pain, different. Addiction versus a brain tumor, uh, different. Nonetheless, especially for providers to make that pivot from resentfulness and disdain for patients with prescription drug abuse and other substance use disorders toward compassion, I think embracing this idea that addiction is a chronic, relapsing, remitting brain condition is enormously helpful. The other thing is that if you compare other chronic illnesses with the behavioral component, like type 2 diabetes, right, the diet is the behavioral component, asthma, certain types of heart disease, you find that addiction behaves a lot like other chronic illnesses with a behavioral component. The same types of relapse rates, the same types of remission rates, the same types of non-compliance non rates. As I've already talked about, denial is part of the illness. Again, I think that's important to remember as you feel like you're being conned by this patient or you even find out that they lied to you. Um, I didn't talk about self-medication, but in, in terms of the medical narratives, we talked about stages of change, pain is the fifth vital sign. Another thing that I hear a lot is, doctor, I, I'm not addicted, I'm self-medicating my depression. If you would just help my depression, then I wouldn't have to use these substances in this aberrant um, way. And you know, I think that's really very true for chronic pain patients. As soon as you fix my pain and I no longer have it, I don't need to be on 700 milligrams of oxycodone a day. Right? And so we really have to educate folks about the self-medication hypothesis and how indeed, you know, chronic pain, having severe chronic pain, just like having any, any mental illness, is a risk factor for depression. Once you've developed the disease of addiction, you've got two diseases. You've got chronic pain and you've got addiction. And if we just focus on one, the other one will not get better. And that's been shown really quite significantly in the psych psychiatric literature. If you've got people who have depression and addiction and you just treat the depression, their addiction really doesn't get better. If pain is the fifth vital sign, then I'm asking you to consider that substance use is the sixth vital sign. Let's incorporate that in our educating physicians and other providers. I talked about being beware of stages of change. The good news is that 22 states now require or recommend education on substance use for prescribers. And there is something called now addiction medicine fellowships where physicians from any um, background can spend a year or two learning about how to treat substance use disorders. Solution number two, we've got to pay providers to treat addiction. They're not going to treat it if they don't get paid. We talked about the Affordable Care Act. Starting January 1st, 5 million previously uninsured Californians will become eligible for enrollment, expanded Medi-Cal, or subsidized health insurance coverage. I don't know if any of you caught the New York Times front page article this morning talking about how those states like Georgia, which have opted out of expanded Medicaid, will not, not only not be providing that expanded parity coverage to their, uh, their population, but will in fact be revoking funds from safety net hospitals who have previously um, provided health care for those patients. So that's really um, going to be a disaster in those states. But the great news about the Affordable Care Act is it now assures parity in mental health and addiction treatments, and that is really good news. The challenge will be enforcing it, right? Anybody can say they have parity, but with all the various carve-outs, you know, how, whether or not it will actually come to pass remains to be seen. TRICARE is the insurance for uh, military veterans folks actively in the military, and it now reimburses for medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorders, which is to say it will now pay for things like Suboxone and Methadone for opioid use disorders where it didn't previously. Solution number three, integrate treatment. So um, you had asked about, you know, how are we going to get folks to acknowledge both the pain condition and the psychological issues. And this is actually a huge push of the Affordable Care Act and the, Obama, and the Obama administration, is to integrate treatment for all these various disorders, and which is why this term, the medical home, has become so prevalent, this idea that we need to do it all in one place. 
Um, screening brief intervention and referral to treatment is um, a new push, an evidence-based movement to have primary care doctors do screening and brief interventions within the primary care setting around substance use disorders. And it has been shown for people who are at risk to develop addiction, not for people who already have the disease, but who are at risk to develop it. If you do a brief intervention, an education, a motivational interviewing thing, you can get people to change their behavior. There are also federal qualified health care centers where they're looking to reverse locate substance use treatment in primary care. That is to say, to bring in um, pri uh, addiction specialists, put them actually in the primary care clinic and have those first folks work alongside each other. And also what's um, taking primary care folks and moving them into uh, addiction treatment clinics. And also trying to provide more medical services in places like methadone clinics where you have very high rates of HIV and hepatitis C. Thinking along the lines of integrating treatment for chronic pain patients and uh, addicted patients, in a way that's a, a really natural fit because so much of the treatment that we already provide for folks with addiction is very similar to the treatment that we provide for folks with chronic pain. Individual and group therapy, um, mindful-based meditation, improved coping. Obviously, for many folks in addiction, we try to get them off of their addictive drugs, and now there's a big push in order to avoid this opioid-induced hyperalgesia. A lot of chronic pain patients are being encouraged to get off of their opioids. And the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, which has been pr proven to be very effective for folks with alcohol use disorders who engage in Alcoholics Anonymous. There are even some really um, interesting, innovative programs, like one I visited at Kaiser recently, using a 12-step model for chronic pain patients. So having them conceptualize their chronic pain issues as almost an obsessional uh, kind of pain avoidance, similar to the addictive behaviors that we see in folks with substance use disorders. Solution number four, mandate prescription drug monitoring systems. So prescription drug monitoring systems are state-by-state uh, -state systems whereby a physician can enter once you're licensed to do so, and the, the process can be cumbersome, especially in California. You enter the name and date of birth of your patient into the, uh, into the cures. In California, it's called cures. And then it pulls up all, or at least most, it doesn't capture everything, of the controlled substances that individual has been prescribed in the last three to six months, incredibly useful. Because like I told you, it's really impossible to tell uh, what people are doing unless you have some kind of objective evidence for all the reasons that I've talked about, malingering, denial, the con, et cetera. And it's amazing, you get to see exactly who the doctor was who prescribed it, what the, what the substance, what the medication was, how many they got, when they got it, which pharmacy they used. And you know, I've had little old ladies with you know, sheets this long. Um, so I'm sure you all can imagine. Unfortunately, only 16 states mandate providers to use pr prescription drug monitoring systems, and we're hoping that um, California will soon mandate and also Im Im improve accessibility to cures. So what, what you're hearing a lot now in uh, pain clinics is implementation of risk evaluation and mitigation strategies. And this is this idea that we really need to do a better job of in advance figuring out who are our accidental addicts, right? Even separate from the people who might have an overlooked addiction or the people who are malingering, how about these people who might go on to develop an addiction because of the medications that I prescribe them? So we need to screen for substance use disorders, not just in the individual currently or in the past, but also in family members, right? Because of that huge genetic heritability. You need to ask about behavioral addictions, especially in my experience, disordered eating. I have seen so many status post gastric bypass patients who go on to develop alcohol addiction and have strictures, so have real bona fide chronic pain, develop prescription opioid addiction, really complicated cases. These people really should be identified in advance so that you know that they're a vulnerable population and you can care for them in that way. Psych history, family history. We need to mandate prescription drug monitoring systems. If you have access to that, we're really encouraging physicians who prescribe controlled substances to do a cures on everybody. Just see what folks are doing. You know, get the data, it can't hurt, and it probably will help. We also recommend um, urine toxicology screens. They're imperfect, but they're, it's, another, it's another data point. And finally, using random callbacks and pill counts. That looks like this. You call a patient, you might have seen them and prescribed them 
you know, uh, clonopin uh, for sleep on a Friday. The following Wednesday, you call and you say, you know, I'd really like you to come in on Wednesday. And, um, you know, my nurses wants to see, you bring in your bottle, we want to count how many pills you've used and how many you've left, just because we want to be safe and we want to make sure that you don't um, fall into aberrant behavior. And that not only helps uh, patients um, kind of feel cared for and mitigates risk around substance use, but it also identifies what we call the divergers. Those are folks who get prescription medication from a doctor and then sell them on the street. And let me tell you, it's a lucrative business. One milligram of oxycodone sells for about a dollar. So, you know, if you're looking at 180 pills for a month, that's potentially hundreds of dollars to be made. And we know it happens, right? People who don't take any of their prescribed pain medications or only take a portion and sell the rest, it's a decent income, especially if you're vulnerable in other ways because you're unemployed or on disability. We really need to update our electronic medical records. I talked a little bit about 42 CFR, the way that our ability to communicate around substance use issues are really hampered by this regulation. The original intent of the regulation was a good one. What was happening was that police were going into methadone clinics, dragging people out of methadone clinics and putting them in jail. So people were afraid to get treatment for their addiction because of the legal repercussions that might happen just by, by people knowing where to find them. But Unfortunately, the 42 CFR has had these unintended consequences of really hampering our ability to communicate openly about our patients, particularly the ones who have prescription drug abuse and might be getting their drug abuse down the hall. And I can't even talk to that doctor. That doesn't make any sense. Um, now people are looking at ways to use electronic medical records to prompt providers to ask about substance use disorders. And I just read about um, a the ED system or the EDI system in Oregon, in Oregon, which flags patients in real time who reach a number of um, ER visits. Very helpful because ER is one of the major places in which people go to get prescription drugs that they um, are misusing or abusing. Solution number seven, reverse opioid deaths. So there are now Good Samaritan laws in 17 states which say if you try to use Narcan to help somebody um, Narcan is an opioid antagonist. It can reverse uh, an overdose with opioids. You know, you're not going to be le legally liable. We're going to protect you. You can do that. There's also a huge movement to actually prescribe and dispense Narcan when people get an opioid prescription, which would be an interesting um, change. And then finally, um, strong move to restrict, uh, restrict prescribing. 32 states now require or permit pharmacists to request an ID before dispensing controlled substances. It's kind of like asking for an ID at a bar. Now some pharmacies, they have to ask you um, for your ID uh, before they pre uh, dispense prescribed substances. The reason for that is because in the process of um, obtaining drugs of abuse through a prescriber, a lot of people change their name, change their address, change their birth date so that they won't show up. They hope they won't show up on these various uh, drug monitoring systems. 46 states have pharmacy lock-in programs. That means for people who have been identified as prescription drug abusers but still need prescription drugs for their medical condition, you can only go to one provider and you can only go to one pharmacy. Finally, hydrocodone, Vicodin, just moved from a schedule, uh, schedule, schedule three to schedule two, which means you can only give a month at a time. You can't give refills without being seen again. That's very good news. On the other hand, as you all probably know, the FDA just approved Zohydro ER. Zohydro ER is a sustained release hydrocodone, which is the equivalent of oxycodone. And as we all know, oxycodone has been really deadly. So here on, the, on, on, on one day, they move Vicodin, hydrocodone, to Schedule 2, and virtually in the same week approve Zohydro ER, um, which is the sustained release. Uh, hydrocodone. And, and you know, when oxycodone first, came, Purdue Pharmaceuticals put oxycodone out, and what they said was oxycodone will be less abusable because it's long acting, right? Drug addicts want a quick fix, they want that quick absorption, they want the high. This long acting agent won't do that. Well, what they discovered was it did just that for 10 hours instead of for two hours. And the big fear is now this is what's going to happen with Sohydro. And I thought it was great that Sean said, you know, what we don't need is more meds. We've got plenty of meds. What we need is other more novel ways to target this problem. Thanks for listening.
Does anyone have any questions? So the question is how you identify the patient who's dependent versus the patient who's abusing it. <clears throat> okay, so that's a great question. This word dependence is one that has been phased out of the DSM-5 um, in terms of the way that they define a substance use disorder. And the reason that it's been phased out is that anybody who's on um, a potentially addictive substance like opioids for a sustained period of time can develop physiologic dependence. Just because you have physiologic dependence doesn't mean that you have the disease of addiction. And so that language we don't use anymore, but when we did use it, the way that it was generally used was if you had substance abuse, it had to do more with consequences, whereas substance dependence included consequences, compulsive use, and out of control use. The way that I always teach how to remember how you define addiction is the three C's. Consequences of use, compulsive, obsessional use, and continued use uh, despite consequences. So that's kind of the way that we think about it. We don't really think, does this person have abuse and dependence? Because anybody could have dependence. The DSM-5 doesn't use that, that terminology anymore. And really what we're looking, again, is for uh, the three Cs, consequences, compulsion, and out of, out of control. So, so the, the question was, the boxing has been touted as a way to treat addicted chronic pain patients. What's your take on that? So in general, um, if you look at the meta-analyses of treatments for substance use disorder, again and again and again, one of the most convincing findings is opioid replacement therapies for people with opioid use disorders. And now that includes Suboxone as well as Methadone. So there's no doubt in terms of you know, recidivism rates, relapses, HIV risk, Hep C risk, needles, using opioid replacement for severely opioid disordered patients works. Does it also work for chronic pain and addiction? I think it's a really nice two for one because it's a long acting opioid that can help with chronic pain and it gets people out of this cycle of intoxication and withdrawal that they get with other opioids because it's got an incredibly long half-life on the order of 36 hours. So yes, I think it's a, a, great, um, a great new tool. Um, where it gets complicated for me personally is with young people. Because you know, I see Stanford students snorting, you know, 80 milligrams of Vicodin a day, and really serious addictive disease. And I think to myself, now, do I want to put this person on replacement therapy in the form of Suboxone, which will probably help them a lot, but then might commit them to a lifetime of Suboxone treatment because of the neuroadaptation changes that we see? that occur in the brain when you're chronically on an addictive substance. So that's where I have more ambivalence, but for the not young people category, I am, you know, I think it's a it's a very effective solution and the data support that.